previously in the complete creation. One of the more important features of this particular track is the prominent displaced mud surrounding the footprint. This is called the expulsion rim, and it's simply caused by the foot of the person or animal stepping into the mud and the mud getting displaced around the perimeter of the foot. Welcome back and thank you for joining me again for another part in this adventure. We spent the last several lectures looking primarily at the fossil evidence and its significance from the Paluxy River in Texas. Profound evidence of humans living alongside dinosaurs. We were looking at fossil footprints left behind by both dinosaurs and humans and how destructive testing of the human footprints was used for analysis in the past. The results of this destructive testing were often ambiguous. So Dr. Carl Baugh from the Creation Eminence Museum led the charge to use CT scanning technology as a non-destructive method of testing fossil footprints for authenticity. So remembering that CT scans are three-dimensional x-rays, and x-rays simply depict a higher density material as bright or white, while a lower density material appears darker to black as zero density. I've been honored to be a part of the research team at Creation Eminence Museum using and refining the CT scans in the study of loose slab fossil footprints. We have now scanned about a dozen slabs, including both genuine and carved tracks and rocks, as well as fossil footprints not from the Paluxy River. For example, as I mentioned in the last lecture, David Lines and myself, as part of the research, took some genuine Paluxy limestone, carved and acid etched it, as per the description of a couple of people who did carve fake human tracks during the Depression. We then broke the rock apart at spots we carved so we could see the cross section of the rock and then subjected the control rock to CT scanning. This control rock proved to be even more enlightening than we had counted on. For example, we discovered that the acid etching actually leaves telltale signs in the rock. So later on, when this fossil track was brought to the Creation Evidence Museum, David spotted the telltale signs of acid etching in the rock from like a mile away. Now, we were pretty confident that the track itself was actually a genuine fossil human footprint. But without letting on what we knew, we asked the gentleman who found the rock if he had cleaned the rock or used any chemicals on it. He did not hide what he had done and pointed out how there was a thin but hard rough crust of white crystal on the surface of the rock. And so he poured muriatic acid on the area of the track to clean off this whitish crystal coating in order to make the track more visible. Now again, remember, most of these loose slab tracks were either discovered in or cut from the riverbed by amateurs. He didn't know the history of the use of acid in the making of carved tracks, and he didn't know that you shouldn't try to clean the track up in any way, at least not without heavily documenting the cleaning and procedures that you perform. So while we believe the track to be a genuine fossil footprint, we basically do not use this track simply because we know it's been altered. It has been cleaned with muriatic acid. But I showed you this CT scanning image of our control rock in the last lecture. We specifically chose a rock with an undulating surface and we carved the rock with chisels and a grinding stone. We cut deep into the rock with no regard to the contours here. And at this spot, we specifically tried to make a naturally occurring depression in the rock a little bit deeper. 
We did this specifically because of the testimony of track carvers who said they selected a rock slab that had already had some depressions in it that could be incorporated into the track they intended to carve. This was mainly to save work. If the rock had a depression or depressions already in place, then it saves that much work. The carver simply carves away at the rock to make his footprint, making use of the depressions already there. So that's why I specifically wanted to make sure we did some carving, incorporating some of the depressions already in the rock. So even here, you can see that the hard surficial veneer has been uh, thinned from the work or cut through completely. While that veneer varied in thickness, it is still obvious that the veneer does not follow the contours of the depressions we carved. And why would it? The harder veneer would conform to natural depressions and impressions in the rock and would be cut out when the rock was carved. Another significant point to be made here before we move on. When I first published a video on YouTube 13 years ago detailing the CT scans of the Delk track, which I touched on last week. <clears throat> In fact, uh, this spot right here where the dinosaur's middle toe clipped the human footprint is some of the highest density rock you'll see in the slab. The reasons are obvious. The mud was stepped on by and compacted first by the human, then further compacted when the dinosaur stepped in and on the same mud. The compaction is visible for some four centimeters deep and wide to the sides of the dinosaur toe in particular. This was no hard surficial veneer. One YouTuber who obviously knew something about CT scans said the apparent higher density regions was an artificial artifact commonly created in CT scans known as beam hardening. Now, besides the fact that beam hardening is compensated for and removed by the CT scanner algorithm, beam hardening only appears on the surface of the object, not several centimeters deep. Furthermore, take a look at our control rock. In our carvings, there is a complete absence of any higher density rock along the walls of the cut. There is no beam hardening. And this CT scan was performed on the same machine as all the other CT images I'm about to show you. So hogwash, there is no beam hardening going on here on any of the tracks. This also goes to show that the detractors are incorrect in their claim that the density variations visible in the CT scans are not genuine, or that medical CT scanners are inadequate to scan rock. This is demonstrably false on two counts. You are looking at genuine density variations in a control rock, in the exact same rock all of the other tracks are found. We rescanned all of our samples and the control rock on an industrial power CT scanner, and it showed the exact same thing the lower resolution Glen Rose medical scanner showed, just in higher resolution. You can also see where the cracks in the rock where we broke it uh, to examine the internal structure, you will see such cracks, or if the slab in question was cut, uh, you will see the cuts in the CT scans as well. As I showed you in the last lecture, when we cut right through the big toe depression, we can see higher density rock lining the walls of the impression ahead and behind for several centimeters from the forward backward movement of the toe compacting the mud. That depression was not carved. There is higher density rock following the contours of the depression the opposite of what one sees in a carved hole in our control rock. We can even make out the impression left behind by the toenail of the person who made the track right there. A funny thing happened back in 2008 when the Creation Evidence Museum publicized the Dulk. 
An article came out in the Fort Worth Star-Telegram where the author interviewed the granddaughter of the late George Bull Adams, a Glen Rose resident who has admitted to carving tracks during the Depression in order to sell them. In that interview, Zena Douglas said, My dad, Welton Eakin, and my grandfather decided one day, I don't know if it was to make money or what, to start carving man tracks alongside the dinosaur tracks. They poured acid to make the fossils look like aged limestone, she said. They showed one all over town until they heard that a researcher from the Smithsonian Institution wanted to see the track. That worried my grandfather because he didn't want anybody ever passing it off as real, she said. So he and Daddy took it out and buried it. The author of the article, Bud Kennedy, was... <laughs> leading the way in fake news, implying that the Dalt track was the one carved and buried by Bull Adams, completely ignoring the stark discrepancies between Zena Douglas' story and the finding of the Dalt track. But none of us had ever heard this story from Douglas before, and it would prove to be a very important story. Now, we already knew the Dalt track was not a carving because of the CT scans that Kennedy so ignorantly wrote off in his heavily biased article. But several months later, a Glen Rose resident named Dennis Moore was actually digging around the old abandoned Adams family homestead when he found this rock, half buried near the cellar. Even without knowing the story of this track or Zena Douglas's story, there are several things about this track that smacked of it being a carving. So to find an obviously carved track on the property of Bull Adams' family, buried exactly as Douglas had described, may I dare say it was divine providence. We were going to make a carved track anyway, specifically for CT scanning. So here someone <laughs> did all the work for us, and bonus, we had a track with some fascinating history behind it. We had the perfect opportunity to test CT scanning and confirm that it can indeed be used to discern a carved track. Looking at the side profile of the track, it is quite obvious that the hard superficial veneer is gone, except for here, here, and here. This is the big toe. This is the ball, the arch, and the heel impressions. The carver had to cut through that surficial veneer to cut the footprint. This verified what we already knew, that it was a carved track. This also verified that we could see the effects of carving using CT scanning technology. Our process was non-destructive and produced more definitive results than the destructive process of cutting the tracks in half. Now let's make a quick comparison between the Adams Moore track carved in the 1930s and the Willett track removed from a trail of tracks in a limestone ledge in the Paluxy River in the 1950s. Because the feet are opposites, I've mirrored the CT scan of the Adams Moore track to make it easier to compare the two scans. I've got the depressions of the big toe, the ball, the arch, and the heel. Uh, pretty much lined up between the two tracks. And remember, we're looking at the side profile of the tracks, as if we had severed the rock in half. While you can see the higher density rock following the contours of the Willett footprint, you can see that the higher density rock in the Adams Moore track is only visible where the track has not been carved out of the rock. That track is carved, and the removal of the rock to carve the footprint removed that veneer of harder, higher density rock on the surface of the slab. So we can thus confirm that the Willett track is a genuine fossil human footprint found in Paluxy limestone, but it gets better. Remember I pointed out that there was one of those strange web-footed dinosaur tracks in the Willett slab? A dinosaur stepped first, the human stepped second. So even though the Willet is a loose slab, there is a dinosaur track not only in the same rock, 
the human stepped on top of the dinosaur track. Let's take the Willet track and cut into it hundreds of slices going this way. And we'll look at those slices from this direction. So in the lower right corner here, I have a top view of the Willet with a yellow line indicating where we are cutting and the arrow showing the direction we are looking. So let's go through the track slower now and see for yourself how much of the human footprint has higher density sediments lining the contours of the track. Now let's back up a touch and look here. The contours of the dinosaur track are also showing higher density sediments. So there's nothing carved about that fossil track either. It's one of those strange dinosaur tracks that was stepped on by a human while the mud was still soft. The two tracks were made within hours of each other at most. What did Lewis Jacobs say about such evidence? It indicates the earth is young, the biblical account of creation is true, and the theory of evolutionism is falsified. Now, bear in mind when looking at these CT scans, I have the contrast set very high for visualization purposes. It, it's basically false color. But we can actually measure the density at pinpoint locations anywhere in the CT scan. The CT scanner measures in Hounsfield numbers, and the scale is nonlinear. While scanning the other tracks in the high resolution CT scanner, we also scanned the control rock that David and I made, and also a Nalgene water bottle, half filled with water for calibration purposes. The Hounsfield scale is kind of weird. The zero point of the scale is based on the density of water, so one gram per cubic centimeter. Air is negative 1,000 Hounsfields. Plus 1,000 Hounsfields, it's supposed to be double the density of water, but as Janissa et al. demonstrated in their calibration studies of dentition, the actual Hounsfield to density scale is logarithmic. To further confuse matters, <laughs> notice that Janissa et al use air as the zero point on their scale, not water. These inconsistent non-standards of measurements and CT scans was precisely what they were trying to address in their paper and has been a source of confusion for others trying to review the fossil CT scans. So when we take pinpoint measurements on the Nalgene water bottle, the water, as you can see here, is zero. The air in the bottle is negative 1,000 Hounsfield. The plastic is 185. So add in the density of water for the zero point of one gram per cubic centimeter, and you get a density of the plastic at around 1.19 grams per cubic centimeter, which is the density of polycarbonate plastic. So when we take a look at the slabs, we can take pinpoint density measurements anywhere in the scan. Now this gets tricky to know what to expect because limestone has a density of anywhere from 1.76 to 2.75, but this whole Paluxy formation is part of the Austin chalk mega sequence that we talked about in lecture five. So the amount of chalk content can vary wildly and the density can be as low as 1.2. There's also a lot of dolomite in the formation. Magnesium is mixed in with the carbonate rocks, and that makes a harder, denser rock as well, as much as 2.9 grams per cubic centimeter. So we have a pretty wide range of density we find in the Paluxy rocks of 1.2 to 2.9. Uh, that's not taking into account compaction of the limey mud into a higher density by footprints. So let's take a look at one sample cross section of the delt track. We've cut it lengthwise, cutting right through here. So we're seeing this huge higher density region where the human stepped first, compressing the mud, and then the dinosaur stepped on top of the human footprint, further compacting the mud to make 
this huge region of higher density rock. This spot here seemed to represent an average density of the rock slab and had a Hounsfield number of 1148, which works out to a density of about 1.75, right in the region of lighter limestone, which I would agree with. Uh, the rock is very friable, and Doug Harris, Daniel Eliff, and I spent uh, an hour just claying up the copious cracks in the rock so we can make a mold. If we hadn't stopped up the cracks with clay, the silicone would have leached in between the cracks, hardened up, and when we went to demold, we would have literally ripped the rock apart. Frankly, this was one of the initial reasons I was skeptical about the claim that the Dulk was a carving. First of all, <laughs> that's the first thing the skeptics say every single time another fossil footprint comes to light. Oh, it's a carving. Ugh. Secondly, the rock was way too friable to work without the slab itself breaking up. It just comes apart way too easily. So compare a density of 1.75 for the average rock with the large, higher density region that was compacted by both the dinosaur and human footprints, we see a Hounsfield number of 2490, which works out to a density of about 2.1 or so. I also sampled the lowest density uh, values right here with a Hounsfield number of 561, so a density of around 1.3. This is just to give you an idea of how much compaction is going on on the slabs caused by the action of the foot uh, moving the mud around. With the Willet and the Delk both having a dinosaur track and a human track in the slab, then they are both of critical importance because it suddenly becomes irrelevant whether or not they are in situ. The slabs are each carrying both a dinosaur and human footprint in situ in the slab itself. The importance of this point cannot be overstated. We are dealing with loose slab undocumented fossils, which someone could write off saying, oh, we have no idea where that rock came from. Yeah, so what's your point? That is completely and entirely irrelevant because it contains a genuine dinosaur track and a genuine human footprint in the same rock, stepping on top of each other. So, if the tracks are genuine fossils and not carved, then we have slam dunk evidence that dinosaurs and humans coexisted. Provenance is irrelevant. Where the rock came from is irrelevant. Who excavated or found it is irrelevant. The fact that they didn't document it in situ is irrelevant because the two tracks provide in situ documentation for each other. And in the case of the Delt track in particular, because the human stepped first in the mud, one cannot attempt the pathetic argument that some have attempted, suggesting that Oh, perhaps millions of years after the dinosaur tracks were made, the rock again somehow became soft. A modern day human stepped in the now soft rock, leaving an impression of their foot in the rock and dinosaur track. Besides being a frankly ridiculous argument, it falls flat on its face with the dulk track because oh, how the turntables, the human would have made its fossil footprint then somehow the rock became soft again and a dinosaur walked in the now soft rock, leaving an impression of its feet in both the rock and human footprint. Humans appearing in the fossil record before dinosaurs destroys the evolution myth and affirms that the earth and everything on it is young, only a few thousand years old, exactly as the Bible described. So the CAT scans of the Willet and Delt tracks are of paramount importance. You've now seen the CAT scan of the Willet track showing that both the dinosaur and human track are genuine, compacting the mud, which has now turned to stone. Let us now turn our attention to the CAT scans of the Delt track, where hopefully you now know what to look for. There is higher density sediments in the contours of both footprints, but most almost counterintuitively, you'll notice that compaction happens the most at the sides of the tracks and between the toes. 
for lack of a better word, the movement of the foot forward and back and left to the right is far greater than the movement of the foot in the mud in a downward direction. This is true for both dinosaur and human footprints. You will see some higher density regions under the foot, but the highest densities appear to be the sides of the depression and in between the toes in particular. The largest, highest density areas are where the two feet both stepped in the same mud, compacting it twice, producing higher density regions penetrating very deep into the rock. That is a genuine fossil human footprint, and that is a genuine fossil dinosaur footprint, both in the same slab of rock and stepping on top of one another. As Lewis Jacobs so succinctly pointed out, this demonstrates that the Earth is young on the order of a few thousand years, not millions or billions of years. It demonstrates that the biblical account of creation in the book of Genesis is the correct account of Earth's history. It demonstrates that the evolution myth is false in all totality. I'm out of time for this segment. I hope you'll join me again in the next lecture, where we'll look at still more evidence that dinosaurs and humans coexisted. Coming up in the next Complete Creation. Frankly, my jaw hit the floor when I first saw this cast. Two things were immediately evident. There was a very prominent expulsion rim surrounding the track, strongly indicating that it was indeed an actual fossil footprint. Two, it would seem that Mr. Ingalls, writing about these tracks in Scientific American, was practicing fake news 80 years before Trump ever coined the phrase. These were most certainly not the tracks in the photos that Ingalls provided in his article. You can catch the entire series in a variety of ways. You can watch the show online at www.completecreation.org or www.genesisweek.com. You can also purchase the Complete Creation series in full high definition on Blu-ray or video on demand at completecreation.org. Or support the Miracle Channel with a monthly tax-deductible donation and access the entire Complete Creation series in high definition through Corco, Miracle Channel's video on demand service. We need your support to keep this program on the air. So please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4. Or you can make a donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org forward slash donations. And thank you for your support. Mm -hmm.